Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 110, Cultural Appropriation. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my compassionate and understanding co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing all right. How about you? Doing all right. A little hot today. Uh, I think we got up into the 90s today. Mm. <clears throat> Hottest day of the year so far. Yep. But that's what they make air conditioning for. <laughs> yeah. Anything exciting going on this week? Uh, I just have a couple of quizzes and tests and stuff. Nothing really too big. Okay. Well, it seems like an easy week then. So this week we are talking about cultural appropriation. We'll help you understand what cultural appropriation is by looking at the meanings associated with the phrase and other vocabulary associated with cultural appropriation. We'll take a look at some real-world examples of cultural appropriation and why they're considered cultural appropriation. And finally, we'll look, at, we'll look at ways to know if something is cultural appropriation and how to avoid cultural appropriation in our everyday lives. Ready to get started? Sure. All right. So... The research for this week's podcast actually comes from uh, VeryWellMind.com, which uh, we've used several times in the past. So let's first consider what's meant by each of the terms in the phrase cultural appropriation, as well as some of the related terms that are important to understand. Why don't you tell us what these terms mean? So, for the first word in the phrase culture, culture refers to anything associated with a group of people based on their ethnicity, religion, geography, or social environment. This might include beliefs, traditions, language, objects, ideas, behaviors, customs, values, or institutions. Mm -hmm. Most often, culture is thought of as belonging to a particular to particular ethnic groups. Yes, it, it is often attributed to ethnic, ethnic groups, but there are different types of culture out there. You can have religious culture. You can have geographic culture. A lot of the nationalism that happens can be considered a culture. You know, people that are pro-American, that's a culture. Okay. Uh, from a religious standpoint, you know, being Jewish is a culture as well. Uh, being uh, Muslim is a culture. There are traditions and everything that go along with that as well. So it's not just ethnicity. Uh, a lot of what we see today with cultural appropriation has to do with ethnicity, with uh, African-American cultural appropriation or uh, Native American or indigenous people appropriation as well. So it's important to, to keep in mind that it's not just ethnicity. It's other things. Okay. So what do we mean by appropriation? So appropriation refers to taking something that doesn't belong to you and most often refers to an exchange that happens when a dominant group takes or borrows something from a, mon from a minority group that has historically been exploited or oppressed. In this sense, appropriation involves a lack of understanding or of appreciation for the historical context that influences the act of what is being taken. For example, taking a sacred object from a culture and producing it as part of a Halloween costume. Yeah, and that's one. That's a very common form of cultural appropriation. Um, but we also see it in other forms such as uh, sports teams and mascots is mm. another one that's very uh, much in the news today. So there are different ways to appropriate it. 
<clears throat> one other thing that's associated with cultural appropriation but it is different is cultural denigration. Tell us about that. Cultural denigration refers to when someone adapts an element of a culture with the sole purpose of, hum of humiliating or putting down people of that culture. The most obvious example of this is blackface, which, orist which originated as a way to put down people of color as having certain undesirable personality traits. Yeah, blackface is something. I don't know if you're familiar with blackface. I think I've... Um, heard of it before. It's something that sort of came out of the vaudeville era where you had uh, white actors <clears throat> who would put on black makeup and portray themselves as African Americans, but they would do it in a way that was um, insensitive and portraying stereotypes of uh, popular stereotypes at the time of uh, African Americans at the time. So it was not at all an accurate depiction of the culture, and it was deliberately meant to be used at the expense of members of that culture. Mm. Uh, another example of this <clears throat> is all of the, or most of the uh, television Western shows in the 1950s and 60s with the Cowboys and Indians. And, you know, the Indians were all played by white actors that were in makeup. And the Indians were always portrayed as being uneducated, um, not very smart, savages, and just they were the bad guys. You know, when you played cowboys and Indians, if you were the Indians, you were the bad guys. Um, so that was another form of cultural denigration that was predominant through the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Mm. Now, the flip side of all that is cultural appropriation and respect. Let's talk a little bit about that. I think you mean appreciation. Yes, that's it. You said appropriation. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> cultural appreciation and respect, yes. Cultural appreciation is the respectful borrowing of elements from another culture with an interest in sharing ideas and diversifying oneself. Examples would include learning martial arts from an instructor with an understanding of the practice from a cultural perspective or eating Indian food at an authentic. authentic Indian restaurant. When done correctly, cultural appreciation can result in creative hybrids that blend cultures together. And this is really, <clears throat> as a society, this is really what we should be striving for. Uh, because the one wonderful advantage that we have in this country is we have such a diverse culture. We have so many different cultures that we can sample from. And you see this a lot um, when we go into the city. You know, if we go into the city to a convention or something like that, you can drive five or six blocks and go through four different cultures. And you get different styles of dress, different styles of food. You get to experience all of these things in this, you know, wonderful melting pot that we have. And that appreciation of those cultures makes us better for that. You know, for, for the longest time, I didn't get to experience <clears throat> Indian culture or Chinese culture. Um, but when you venture into the city, most cities are like this. You have all these ethnic groups that tend to congregate in their own areas of the city, and you can walk from neighborhood to neighborhood, and it's almost like traveling around the world. It really is the, the, the richness that you get from the cultures, and it's something to appreciate. Um, and I think a lot of people kind of take that sort of thing for granted, especially a lot of people who live in the city take it for granted that it's there. Uh, coming from a suburban lifestyle like I did, you didn't have any of that stuff. You know, the first time that I got to travel through the city, I was amazed at the diversity that you had there and and just the variety that you had when you went from block to block. Uh, you've experienced that. You know, when we go into the city, what are your what are your thoughts on that level of diversity that a city brings you here? Well, it's definitely really cool to see all these different cultures being represented while you just walk a few f 
a few blocks. It's really amazing how far we've come and how much appreciation and diversity we have right now. And I get to experience other cultures that if we didn't go into the city or this wasn't happening, I probably would have never experienced or learned about unless I was, of course, in history. Absolutely. And the other thing that we have uh, the advantage of is, you know, we travel to Disney frequently. And one of the shining examples of cultural diversity is going to Epcot, where you can literally walk from country to country. And it's not. <clears throat> Unlike other things in Disney, it's not actors that are in uh, costume portraying these roles. These are actual residents of these countries that they come in and they're they're part. Most of them are part of the uh, Disney University program, and and they're part of they're exchange students, and they live on property for periods of time. But they run the venues, they run the restaurants and the stores and the shops and everything. Ooh. I never knew that. Yeah. And they're actual, like, you know, we go to Mexico. Those are actual, you know, residents of Mexico who live there and are here on exchange. Um, so it's, there's a level of authenticity there that you wouldn't normally expect with Disney. Uh, that's an even more, I think, vibrant experience going, going into that and, and experiencing that type of environment. Mm-hmm. You know, when we go to France, you know, we, we ate at the restaurant in France the one time and our waitress was, you know, from a little town outside of Paris when we talked to her and like, that's really cool. And, and they're there to exchange their culture, which is what's, what's really nice. I mean, in the, when you experience that cultural exchange in the cities, they're not there for the purpose of educating you. They're there to live their lives. So. Mm -hmm you're oftentimes fortunate enough to experience that culture as part of that regular life experience. Um, but when you go to Epcot, they're there to educate you. They're there to share their culture. They're there to answer your questions. And, and there's always, there's tons of questions that I always have when I show up to, to folks, you know, from their traditional dress to the foods, to where they come from and what do they like about where they lived? You know, it's, it's, to me, it's very interesting to get to know people on that level. And Disney offers a very unique experience for that. Mm -hmm. So we're going to come back. We know what we're talking about now as far as cultural appropriation. We're going to come back and we're going to talk some examples of uh, cultural appropriation and uh, put up some, some shiny examples of how not to culturally appropriate. We'll be right back. For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. So we've talked about a few examples of cultural appropriation already, but there's tons of examples of cultural appropriation out there, some of which we might not even realize is considered cultural appropriation. Okay. Um, why don't you go down? We have a, a list here. Let's go down the list and we'll dissect that list. Okay. So the first on the list is intellectual 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 property like patents copyright industrial designs and trademarks right so can you think of any examples of intellectual property that's been uh, culturally appropriated 
Um. Hmm. How about something where somebody has a, a copyright on a song? Yeah, I was going to say, like, I was thinking copyright with songs. Like sticking to the Disney theme. What's the one song that we always love to sing that came from a popular Disney movie? Um. Uh, oh. Uh, we do the background vocals and Mommy does the main vocals. <laughs> uh, Lion Sleeps Tonight. Lion Sleeps Tonight. That was a traditional African song that was probably one of the best examples of a, a cultural appropriation because it literally was stolen from the, the gentleman who wrote it and made it popular in Africa. And it was recorded by several different artists in the West before Disney got it and used it in Lion King. Mm. And eventually, through the charitable work of uh, a lawyer, they uh, Disney eventually acknowledged the wrong that was done to this particular artist. And they did have a settlement where they paid the family some money for the art itself. Mm. Uh, but... We're talking 30, 40 years later. So that's a great example of intellectual property that's been appropriated. Uh, What's the next one that we have? The next one we have is artifacts. Pottery, weaponry, artwork, tools, and manuscripts and writing. So can you think of any examples that might fit this description? Um, How about something like art? So the first one that comes to mind to me is Native American cultural appropriation. Okay. So a lot of Native Americans have um, their own Native crafts that they do. They'll do clothing. They'll do um, tapestries, things like that. And what happens is when uh, you go to a touristy area, say somewhere in Oklahoma or Texas or something like that, You'll a lot of people will go to the Native American uh, reservations and buy the stuff. Mm. But what happens is you have a lot of nefarious merchants who copy what they have and they mass produce it and they sell it at more main street, uh, mainstream stores. Mm. So instead of it being an authentic uh, garment that was made by a Native American, it's some knockoff somewhere that was made in some factory that is being passed off as that. Mm. So there's cultural appropriation as far as artifacts go. Uh, what about the next one we have? The next one we have is dance. Some examples are from China, the dragon dance. Japan, the kabuki. Kabuki, yeah. Ukraine. Ukraine, the Cossack dance. Cossack dance. Cossack uh, the Native American, the hoop. The hoop dance. Uh, the, the hoppy snake, snake. The rain dance. And, and the then stomp, stomp dance. dance. So the, I, I listed a number of Native American uh, dances in there because there were so many in the, in the research that I did. Mm. But what you have that comes out of this may not necessarily be the exact dance, but what you might get would be something that's popularized that um, an artist – might wind up doing. Mm. Uh, there were a couple of artists, and I, I should have wrote them down, and I did, but there were a number of artists uh, who have taken heat for taking Native American dance moves and, and uh, African tribal dance moves and incorporating them into their dance routines. Mm. And the important thing is, is it's not bad to incorporate that into your routine, or your life, or, or whatever you're doing, where you run into a problem is when you don't credit the the origin of it. Where you you take it, you use it as your own, and you pre pretend that you came up with it. That's really what cultural appropriation is, and that's what a lot of these artists were getting hit for. They weren't crediting the origin of some of the material that they had. Mm. So what's the next one that we have? The next one we have is clothing and fashion, like from India, the sari. Sari, right. Uh, Japan, the kimono. Kimono, yeah. Kimono. 
Um, and Scotland, the kilt. The kilt, yeah. So these are a couple of of uh, very common pieces of clothing that are culturally significant to these other areas of the world. That again, very similar to, to the example that I gave with the Native Americans, where they're producing their own goods, but they're being copied. You're getting some of the same thing, but in this case here, they're referring more to taking the inspiration for these and having fashion designers or clothing producers produce clothing that's based on those, but never crediting the origin of them. Mm. So you run into some issues like that. Like a lot of times you'll go to the Ren Fair and you'll see people in kilts. That's a form of cultural appropriation, but not in so much that you're trying to pass it off as your own. Um, the one thing with, with kilts, unfortunately, I'm not familiar enough with the cultures of the other two examples to talk to great detail about. But with kilts, the pattern of the weave in the kilt itself is attributed to a family or a clan. Mm. So we would have our own, if we were Scottish, we would have our own pattern that we would wear. So it's not just the style but it's the actual design of the pattern in that piece of material that is culturally specific. So that it goes an extra level deep there. Mm. So if you were to dress in a kilt in Scotland, you would be recognized for your clan based on the pattern that's in the cloth itself. Mm. So what's the next one that we have? Uh, the next one we have is language, and all languages are cultural in their nature. Yeah, and this is probably the uniquely cultural thing that everyone has in their culture, and it's the ability to communicate. Now, just because you may know three different languages doesn't necessarily mean it's cultural appropriation. But what they're referring to here is when you start um, appropriating terms and phrases from certain languages into your vernacular and you make it into sort of a slang type um, use of that word where you're not necessarily giving credit to where the terms came from but you may be using them in a derogatory way too so it's not really speaking a different language it's borrowing elements of that language to enhance your own vernacular ah uh. So, and that's where it, it can become insulting in certain circumstances. I can definitely see that. What's our next one? Next up, we have music. And we've kind of talked about this a bit before, but music can be tied to ethnicity, geographic location, religions, in, and, in, and cultural significance. Yes. So, music like language is something else that is very cultural driven. So it can be based on your ethnicity, you know, African Americans have a very distinctive uh, musical sound that their culture provides. And in fact, it's been heavily borrowed upon and stolen in many cases, you know, and we'll talk a little bit later in, in a few of the other examples that we have, um, but Judaism, you know. Religions are very musically inclined. Uh, even Christianity is very musically inclined. Islam, very musically inclined. They're all cultures that are, they're all art forms that are culturally based. Mm. Uh, and when we borrow from any of those without giving them credit, it's cultural appropriation. Mm. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of meaning, especially with Christianity, and there's so many different denominations of Christianity there are there's a music associated with certain types of denominations um, that when they're not treated with respect can then turn into cultural denigration as well ah. so that's that's you know a significant thing to keep in mind what's our next one uh, the next one we have is religious symbols, like for Christianity, the cross, Judaism, the Star of David, Buddhism, the Wheel of Dharma, Dharma, uh, Druidism, Druidism, Tris, the Triskelion, the Triskelion, Islam, the Star of 
and starring Crescent. Uh, Norse polytheism. Poly- polytheism. Polytheism. How do you pronounce that one? I knew you were going to have trouble with that one. It's Thor's hammer. What's Thor's hammer called? Not Mew Mew. I know. <laughs> that, that was like... M- one, m- Mjolnir. Mjolnir. Mjolnir, yes. And it's it's a it's a hammer symbol that they use in their, in their religion. Mm. So, again, you know, there are... Let's take the cross, for example. So, there are Christian crosses. There are... There's what's called an act cross that's actually circular at the top. Okay. There's probably four or five different styles of the Christian cross. All of these stem back to the, uh, you know, the crucifixion of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Well, crucifixions weren't a religious punishment. Crucifixions were a traditional punishment in ancient times. Ah. But because it happened to a certain individual, in fact, mostly most crucifixions happen. They crucified you upside down usually. Oh. Um, which was an interesting distinction. But this was a, an example of that symbol being borrowed and used as a symbol of faith moving forward. Oh. Um, same thing with your Star of David and your, um, your Star and your Crescent. It, these are all symbols that mean something to the adherence to those religions. And when we... Um, take those and we use those in a disrespectful manner or we use those in a manner where we're not treating them with the reverence that the culture itself believes they should be, then it's cultural appropriation, cultural denigration. Ah. So those are just some some examples. Now, the next thing we kind of have to talk about is the um, example or the... um, Groups from which um, cultural appropriation is typically targeted to in terms of the United States. Uh, I don't I, I don't have enough information globally to talk about it. I know there is cultural appropriation that happens in other areas of the world. But in the United States, probably the number one group that is a target for cultural appropriation is African Americans. Um, whether it's their music, um, hairstyles, style of dress. Um, it, these are all things that are being taken. And, and when we talk culture, just like we have our own culture as far as our family goes or as far as relig- religion goes, where you, know, you're, you and mom, you're Jewish. So there's a culture around that, and the things that are associated with that culture are things that are near and dear to us. And when someone violates that by borrowing it without acknowledging or giving us credit for it, or if they borrow it in a way to make fun of that culture, it's going to to bother you, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So some of the groups that are targeted for this are African-Americans, Asian-Americans, especially uh, recently, Hispanic-Americans, and Native Americans for the longest time, where uh, these are groups that have been looked down upon by the majority of people in the country, and they're sort of downtrodden people that their culture has been used against them almost. Mm. Um, And... I think we're, as a society, we're finally reaching a point where we acknowledge that and we acknowledge the richness of these cultures, too. Hmm. Can you think of any other cultures that might be targets in the United States or even in, in anywhere in the world? Um, hmm. You know, if we just rip it from the headlines now and we look at the conflict that's happening uh, in Israel, you have the P- Palestinians who they feel their culture is, is under assault at this point in time, and they're in open conflict with the Israelis. So there's two groups right there that may feel that they're, they're being oppressed culturally. 
Uh, you have uh, Uyghurs in um, uh, where are the Uyghurs at? China. I'm sorry, China. It's an it's a their Uyghurs are a Muslim group in China. Okay. That are being uh, downtrodden by the the communist Chinese government. Uh, it's not so much cultural appropriation as that's cultural denigration there, where they're openly trying to oppress them. Mm. Um, but if you look from a religious standpoint, historically, you know, you see what happened to the Jews in Nazi Germany. You know, you're doing a lot of research now with your uh, diary of Anne Frank. So you are familiar with some of the denigration there. And the fact that they, what what was the one thing that the Germans, the Nazis required the uh, the Jews to wear? They had to wear a yellow star in their chest. Right, and the yellow star was a star of David. So it was the 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 Nazis basically appropriating Jewish culture to mark Jews during that time, so they could be oppressed. Mm-hmm. So this isn't a new phenomenon. This isn't something that just started happening. Um, cultural appropriation and cultural denigration is something that has happened for centuries now. I think nowadays we're finally starting to combat it, which is nice. Um, there were a few few specific American uh, examples that I wanted to talk about as far as appropriation to kind of, you know, hit home on it. And the first one that a lot of people don't realize is cultural appropriation is rock and roll. Really? Tell us about this one. In the 1950s, white musicians invented rock and roll. However, the music style was borrowed from black musicians who never received credit. Music executives choose to promote white performers over black performers, reinforcing the idea that cultural appropriation involves impacts on non on a non-dominant group. Yeah, so rock and roll itself is cultural appropriation. Uh, it was a collection of a number, and even uh, in interviews, Elvis, the king of rock and roll, even acknowledged that a lot of the roots that he had with rock and roll that, that led to his rock and roll career were in African-American music and culture. Um, gospel music was a big influence on him. Uh, soul music, you know, the, the he grew up in... in uh, Mississippi, you know, he moved all around the South. So a lot of what his influences were, at least he gave credit to the African-Americans, the area that didn't were these music producers. Mm. So you had, um, one of his famous songs was Blue Suede Shoes. Blue Suede Shoes was originally written and performed by a black man. And, when Elvis wound up making it big, the producers put him in the forefront, not the original artist of it. Mm. Uh, and it was because of this cultural appropriation attitude and this um, this attitude of not promoting minorities. Yeah, um, there was actually um, a version of that I remember in the one show me and mommy used to watch. Basically... It was dinosaurs versus swamp monsters. I don't entirely remember what they were called, but basically the swamp monsters were supposed to represent the minorities and like they had played music that was similar to the blues music. Right. And basically when um the one dinosaur who wanted to help out and promote the music gave it to the producer, the producer used the music but had a dinosaur singing over it. Yeah. So yeah. I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure that was what they were aiming for showing. And sadly that's stuff that still happens to this day. You know, you have some artists out there who just never get to see the the limelight because of this type of thing. Mm -hmm. So the next example we have is a sweat lodge. Have you ever ever heard of a sweat lodge? I don't know. So in 2011, a motivational entrepreneur named James Arthur Ray was convicted of three counts of negligent homicide after the death of three participants in his pseudo-sweat lodge. 
This is an extreme example of cultural appropriation of Native American tradition. So the sweat lodge is a Native American tradition that's sort of a meditative type of uh, cultural event that Native Americans would do. Okay. And they would, you know, the, the idea is you push the body to its extreme and you experience a uh, higher level thought in the process. Okay. Well, this individual happened to be using it as some type of motivational type of exercise and charging a small fortune for it. And he was discouraging the use of these sweat lodges for safe use. And eventually he wound up killing people while he was trying to, to use this activity. Um, and as a result, the native American, um, legitimate concept of this, meditative process came under fire for it. So because of someone misappropriating this cultural uh, tradition, it has a negative impact on the legitimate version of it, mm. which is unfortunate. Yeah. So this is one, there's an excellent one is one that I had never heard of, but after reading about it, it made sense. And that was voguing. I had no idea what voguing, you know what, no, what voguing means? No. Okay. So, do you remember the voguing craze made popular by Madonna back in the 1980s or 1990s? Uh, whatever she did, I guess, was called voguing. Never really paid much attention to her. Voguing as a dance actually had its roots in gay clubs in New York City and was pioneered by the black and Latin communities. Madonna defends her right to artistic expression, but the question remains how many people will think Madonna invented voguing? So that's it. That's one of these examples where she picked this up from a culture. She took it on as her own, and I'm sure her version of it wasn't exactly the way it was done in these different cultures. But because she was in the forefront of it and she got all the spotlight for it, everyone thinks she invented it because she never gave credit to the area, to the cultures that she took it from. Uh. So that's an example of that. And the last one here is one that's in the news today with team names and mascots and stuff. And that's team mascots. Major sports teams in the United States and Canada are involved in cultural appropriation because of the names of their teams, the Redskins. Aren't the Redskins anymore because it was a derogatory term towards Native Americans. Mm -hmm. Past and present team names uh, include the Chicago Blackhawks, the Cleveland Indians, the Washington Redskins, and the Edmonton Eskimos. Uh, Redskins, a derogatory term for indigenous people. And the term Eskimo has been rejected by the Inuit community um, based in Alaska and, and Canada. And once again, if you aren't sure if something's cultural appropriation, you need to look no further than the reaction from the group from whom the cultural element was taken. If it offends the people that you're taking it from, then it's cultural appropriation. Mm. So we're going to take a quick break. That was a long segment there. We'll come back and we're going to ask some questions and, and point out some things to know if something is cultural appropriation and how to avoid cultural appropriation. Okay. We'll, we'll be right back. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. Today we're talking cultural appropriation. And before we get into how to know if something's cultural appropriation, you had another example of cultural appropriation by our favorite company, Disney. 
Yeah, um, I remember hearing um, at some point that Disney actually had cultural pro- had cultural appropriation happen to one of the most popular films, Peter Pan, specifically the scene where the when um, they all meet the Indians on the island, um, specifically when the song plays, basically talking about red faced man and. Disney received a lot of flack for it, and they actually had to put a disclaimer on it. I actually just thought of it. Yeah, and in fact, sticking with that same thought, Disney's in the process of making changes to their Jungle Cruise to remove some of the cultural uh, insensitive elements that are in the Jungle Cruise. Okay. But what is, how do you know if something's cultural appropriation? And how do you decide whether or not you should appropriate culture? Here's a few questions that, that you should ask any time that you feel you might be appropriating culture. What's your goal with what you're doing? You know, Are you trying to embrace it, enjoy it, learn from it? Or are you trying to enhance yourself from it? Or are you trying to make fun of the culture itself? What's our next one? Our next one is, are you following a trend or exploring the history of a culture? Right. So, go ahead. So, I'm guessing it would be differentiating between what you think is popular or trying to express and explore and learn the history of a culture. Exactly. Exactly. The next is, are you deliberately trying to insult someone's culture or being disrespectful? And I think this one is pretty straightforward, but sometimes people try, they don't try to be disrespectful. You know, you may be trying to be entertaining or tell a joke or something like that, and it turns out to be disrespectful. You just have to be mindful of that. What's next? Next up we have, are you purchasing purchasing, Mm -hmm. purchasing something that is a reproduction of a culture or an original um, example would be artwork? Yeah, that's something we had talked about already. How would people from the culture you're borrowing an item from feel about what you're doing? Are they insulted by it? Are they um, complimented by it? You know, if you are taking something and using it to highlight uh, an injustice or how a culture is being treated, that might not be a problem at that point. Mm Mm-hmm. Next up is, are there any stereotypes involved with what you are doing? I'm guessing just like, are you making one specific group or a specific culture into a stereotype? And pretty mo- pretty sure most stereotypes are pretty bad. Exactly. Are you using a sacred item in a flippant or fun way? Like, are you not taking that cross or that Star of David seriously if it's religion? Are you using a sacred headdress as a costume for Halloween where it would be insensitive? That type of thing. Mm-hmm. Are you borrowing something from an ancient culture and pretending that it's new? Basically, taking something you think it's cool and thinking that, hey, it's okay to say that it's new. I completely created this on my own. Exactly. Are you crediting the source or inspiration of what you're doing? It's not, there's nothing wrong with appreciating culture or using culture, other people's culture. You just have to make sure that you're giving credit where credit is due. Yeah, just like if you really try using any inspiration. Exactly. Uh, We worry. Um, If a person of the original culture were to do what you're doing, would they be viewed as cool, or could they possibly face discrimination? Okay. I'm not not going to expound on that one. I don't know how to expound (laughs) on that. I'm sorry. (laughs) Are you wearing a costume that represents a culture, like a geisha girl or a tribal wear style costume? Um, These are, again, a lot of Halloween costumes. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. In in my research, Halloween costumes took a lot of heat for it because you're really insulting a culture by wearing something like this. Yeah. And what's the last one we have? The last one we have are, are you ignoring the cultural significance of something in favor of following a trend? This kind of goes along with the other question of, are you basically just doing it because it's popular? And are you ignoring, and are you not respecting it because of it? 
Right. And I think, I think the idea is if you can answer these questions to your satisfaction, I think, I think the first, you know, three or four questions from this group will probably give you a good idea of what you're doing is cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. Now, there's ways to avoid cultural appropriation. You know, if you ask yourself the list of questions above and start to under, uh, explore your underlying motivation of what you're doing is a very good reason. Like, why are you trying to use these elements from this other culture? Mm -hmm. uh, again, is it to enhance yourself? Is it to broaden your understanding of that culture? Is it to show appropriation of that culture? Uh, uh, not appropriation. <laughs> you appreciation. Re you really keep missing mix, right. ba -ba 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 -ba, mixing those words up. Is it? Are you showing appreciation for that culture? Like, for instance, I I wasn't raised Jewish, but I still participate in the Jewish holidays that we have here, and that's out of respect for mommy and you and the religion, and it's to broaden my horizons and my experiences as well. It's not necessarily to exploit it or to make fun of it or anything like that. Yeah. What's the next suggestion? The next suggestion is to give credit or recognize the origins of the items that you borrow or promote from other cultures rather than claiming them to be your own original ideas. Right. And I think that's very important. I mean, otherwise it's plagiarism, right? Mm hmm So you need to not do that. Yeah. Don't do don't don't plagiarize. That's a good lesson. <laughs> don't plagiarize. Plagiarism's by it. <laughs> To take the time to learn about and truly appreciate the culture before you borrow or adopt elements of that culture. Learn from those who are members of the culture. Visit the venues. Run, uh, uh, run it by actual members of the culture, such as in restaurants, for instance. If, if you go to eat at an Indian restaurant, ask questions about it. Understand if there is a tradition to it or understand what region the food may come from in the in their country, stuff like that, because that's where you get to uh, build your own appreciation and attend authentic events. Like for instance, you can attend real luau's. Mm -hmm. um, Disney does this at the Polynesian. They actually have members of the Hawaiian culture that run the luau's there. And you can learn a tremendous amount about people and their culture by exploring their art forms their visual arts, their music, their dance, stuff like that. There's so much you can learn about the culture. What's our next one? Our next one is support small businesses run by original members of a culture rather than buying mass-produced items from, a bi from big box stores that are made to represent a culture. Um, so basically, appreciate the people who really do, who are a part of that culture, trying to um, show and teach them rather than buying from a big name company who's trying to represent or replicate the culture. Exactly. And the last thing is be respectful. All cultures have traditions, histories, artwork, food, and other associated cultural treasures that are subject to cultural appropriation. Understand this and be sure to cherish and respect those of your culture and other people's cultures. And really it's, it's, it's the basic human idea of treat others the way that you'd want to be treated. If you didn't want someone appropriating your cultural elements and, and denigrating them and making fun of them, then don't do it to other people. It's, it's literally that simple. Yeah. So we do have a couple of closing thoughts here. So in conclusion, cultural appropriation is the social equivalent of plagiarism with an added dose of denigration. Mm-hmm. Um, if something, it's something to be avoided at all costs and something to educate yourself about. In addition to watching your own actions, it's important to be mindful of the actions of corporations and be choosy of how you spend your dollars, as that's another way of supporting members of the non-dominant culture. Do what you can when you can, and you learn to do better. Right. So, if... There's only just a little bit that you could do. Like, for instance, if I'm at a touristy location and I have the option to buy, um, let's say, a, 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 an area rug, like a, like a Persian rug, okay? I can either buy it from an authentic artist who created it themselves or I can run down to the local convenience store, the local 
you know, box store and buy it. Well, in that situation, it's, it's kind of a no brainer. You buy it from the people who make it because not only will you most likely get a better quality product, you're supporting that culture and chances are there's a lot more history to that piece at that point in time. There's a story behind it. You know, it's not something that came off of a factory machine somewhere. Mm -hmm. Get to know the culture, learn about it, make it an opportunity to expand your own horizons. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll get your closing thoughts. Go for your closing <laughs> remarks. Um, so to everyone out there, um, cultural appropriation is definitely something to be avoided. Like we said, it is the um, social equivalent of plagiarism. And everyone knows plagiarism's bad. Um, if you are going to try and represent a culture, do it properly. Under no have enough knowledge of the culture in order to show it to more people. And if you do do something based off of a culture, at least try and give credit where credit is due. Sage advice as always. Before we go, I would encourage folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get video versions of the podcast listed as insights into things. Audio versions of the podcast you can find listed as Insights into Teens. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Amazon, and pretty much any place you can get a podcast. Uh, I would also encourage folks to write to us, give us your feedback, give us some show suggestions. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We are on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can get high-res versions of our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. We stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. You can get audio versions of the podcast at podcast.insightsintothings.com. You can get us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, we are at insights into things, or you can get links to all those on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. And you. And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights and Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights into Tomorrow, our monthly podcast, hosted by you and my brother Sam. Nicely done. You didn't flub that one. Yeah, surprisingly. Uh, I think that's all we had this week. Another yeah. one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye.